you, you tell us when to break that silence. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm going to start with bringing up the director, Trish Adelsek. Please join us. The producer, Susan Margolin. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for this intimate film. Um, and then we have uh, some familiar faces from the film. Um, uh, I'll, I'll bring them up. Um, um, Michelle Rosenthal, Anthony Feinberg. Wazi Muhammad, Brad Arsini. Are you guys, come up and join, please. <laughs> Ellen Surloff, Andrea Weltner, Steve Weiss, and Barry Werber. You're all here with us. Thank you for being here. Who else? Aki Siriano is also a survivor. Come on down. And we have Elliot Joseph, one of our key executive producers. Why don't you come down, Elliot, too? Please, thank you. This is Michelle Rosenthal, my sister. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you for being here. Um, this is kind of uh, not our usual Q and A's for those who have been here before. Um, uh, we're uh, where it's kind of uh, more of a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so we'll try to herd these cats here, <coughs> and uh, or squirrels maybe. Um, and and I'm just going to start for a question for all of you, actually. And we'll, we'll go down the line, and we'll share microphones, if that's OK. And uh, we don't have enough microphones to, to serve this audience. Um, and 
Um, I wanted to know why it is important for you for this movie to be seen. Why did this movie need to be made? Why is this important to you? Um, and let's start down here. Um, hold on. Yeah, they're on. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Uh, I felt that the story needed to be told. Um, and we were the ones to tell it. We, we experienced it and that's how the truth would be told. And that, that's, that's why I did it. We really think that this should be a call to action and uh, we want change to occur. And the more people that see this and are aware of what happened, maybe good will come of it. And that's why we made this film. I think I should defer to others because I, you know, want to let everyone speak to it. The work of the beast is incessant. And so should be the work of the spirit people. Exactly as you say, it, it really is a call to action, but the action is, as I said in the film, making peace happen. We have to talk to each other. We have to stop being divided and start living together and working towards the good of all. Please tell everybody that you know about the film and we really want to get the word out uh, and share these beautiful testimonies with the world. So I, th I think it's really important. Uh, one, thank you, Trish. Thank you, Susan, for doing this. I, I spend my time traveling from city to city working with Jewish communities, helping them protect themselves. and. The evening of October 27th, probably about 10.30 at night, I saw Steve Weiss, and he came up to me and talked about, hey, I'm here, I listened to the training, and I'm here today. So when I see everybody from the community, it really touches me. And, and I, I can't thank you enough, Trish, because what I do in my organization, Secure Community Network, we're just dedicated to the Jewish community across the country to help protect ourselves. And we can never let this happen again. We can't live in a world where we dismiss any signs of hate. We have to report them, we have to assess them, and we have to hopefully mitigate the next attack. And if we are attacked, we have to mitigate the loss of life. And that's really incumbent upon all of us in this room to do that. So thank you for this incredible film. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Trish, um, for this incredible film, and, um, sorry, it's very difficult, uh, to speak after seeing it, and, and, um, you know, every year, I, it's such a beautiful opportunity to get to see everybody, but it's always so hard to, to relive what we went through, but one thing I'm, I'm excited for, you know, with the release of this in particular is, um, you know, it's, it's, it tends to get a bit dark, you know, like, especially around the world, there's been a lot of tragedies and things that we're all very concerned about, you know, as we should be, as Brad referenced, we need to be vigilant, we need to be prepared. Um, but in that darkness, you know, instead of being in, in a state of despair, uh, I'm blessed to be in a city in Pittsburgh surrounded by these rays of light standing around next to me up here. And I think it was a blessing for all of us in Pittsburgh to, you know, uh, see everybody's strength and the unity that came after, and I'm excited for everybody else around the world to get to meet everybody too. Um, and I think that's gonna shine some light, you know, in these dark times. And, and uh, you know, I just wanna say how much I love everybody here and it's so nice to be with everyone. Yeah. We, we love you back, Wasi, and, mm -hmm. and everybody here. Um, I don't think I can add much to what people said. I just think it's such a, um, it, a powerful showing of, of what hatred can do and the impact it can have. And, and hopefully for people seeing this, it will motivate them to do something 
and to treat other people the way they should be treated. And what a wonderful documentary capturing um, the beautiful people whose, whose lives were lost in this tragedy. The one thing that I can't help but always think about is that we have to learn to take responsibility in some point for protecting ourselves when these kinds of incidents start to happen. And I've said all along, if I didn't have the training that Brad gave me, I probably would have been the 12th victim that day. And I need to pay that forward, and I need to make sure that the rest of the world knows about that. I, I was going to say it's because Audrey said so. so <laughs> but, no, seriously, the a lot of what I said, I'm not going to repeat it again, but it's... Although as, as Jews, we tend to read and reread the Torah as a, as a reference point. Uh, what we, we draw from an incident such as this is how to move forward and to look forward and to, and to change. And I think that that was one of the, the main motivating reasons for participation. For me, the motivation was a little different. My parents are Holocaust survivors. My father was in forced labor camp. My mother was in Auschwitz. And then, in 2001, on September 11th, my sister was murdered by terrorists. So when this happened, I texted Trish um, and she texted back that she was in Pittsburgh visiting her father. So I said, let's get a crew, let's make a documentary. For the people that are true believers, they don't need to be convinced. For the people that hate, they'll never be convinced. But for the vast number of people in the middle who are indifferent, to suffering and hate, maybe you'll convince them what this does to people. By telling the intimate stories of individuals, you'll reach people. It's too horrifying talking about dozens or hundreds or thousands or millions that are killed. But when you see the suffering of one individual, it touches people and maybe it'll change them in some small way. And I wanted to thank Trish for making something out of nothing. <laughs> well, uh, you did a Elliot, great job. Uh, uh, Elliot's a dear friend. I've known him for uh, 30 years. And he, uh, he sent the first grant and um, made it possible for me to begin the work the day after the attack. And um, it's been a profoundly moving experience for me. I feel like this is my new family. I love everyone on the stage so dearly. And for the rest of my life, I will honor the me the, their memories the, of their loved ones by doing good deeds and spreading the word. Like love like the boys for Michelle and Diane, for Cecil and David, and for all of them, for Richard and for Rose and for everyone that was so wrongfully taken. Um, it was the greatest honor of my life to make this film. And it wouldn't have been possible if Elliot hadn't helped financially to get the camera crew growing and giving me the encouragement to do it. Um, and we made it in a very particular way. It was a trauma-informed way. I had a, a training to do this work. I don't think I would have had the courage or the confidence had I not had that training to approach such a delicate, very painful subject matter. But everyone was so kind and so courageous and so welcoming. Um, it was just remarkably profound for me, and I will be forever changed. I lo also lost my father during the making of the film, and um, within all of that, they were so kind to me during that time, and I want to thank everybody for, for supporting me through that, because I was in Pittsburgh. I wound up living in Pittsburgh for three years um, and stayed and made the film. So uh, please spread the word. We, we are doing an education campaign inspired by Mr. Rogers called Love Your Neighbor, which will enlist peace ambassadors, youth peace ambassadors nationwide to learn how to address hate in their schools and in their communities. 
And we're also working with Brad Orsini and the Secure Community Network to ensure that over the, the over 4,000 synagogues in America that have all the training, additionally in tandem with black churches and mosques, so that we can keep everyone safe if we have to live in this climate of hate. Uh, we want to do everything we can to help each other. And so um, if you haven't had the training, please let Brad Orsini know, or please direct him to the Secure Community Network so they can make arrangements for the synagogues and churches and communities in need. We really want to make sure that's a tangible item, and it's an easily achievable item, actually. So it will premiere on HBO on Wednesday, October 26th, and I'll let Susan give the, hash, the social media handles. <laughs> if you're on social media, you can follow us at, at a tree of life doc. So on, on all the major um, platforms. Thanks Terrific. everyone for coming I'm, I'm going to ask one question, and then uh, I want to give an opportunity for some people in the audience also to ask some questions. But tell us a little bit more about this unique way of making the film. I, I, I think our audience would like to hear what, what that really means and, and how that works. Sure. Uh, it's a trauma-informed approach. I had made, my last film was called I Am Evidence. And I interviewed 14 survivors of sexual violence. And I worked for about three years with a trauma-informed therapeutic team. And I worked with one of the survivors initially on which questions to ask so that they weren't triggering and they were um, questions that were comfortable uh, for the participant. And I did that with Audrey Glickman. Um, I had a connection to Audrey and um, we worked on questions and I asked all of the participants in the film the same question so that I could weave together their responses. But additionally, um, to really be thoughtful in what you ask and what the exchanges are, that you cannot be in a rush. Um, a lot of victims complained about how insensitive reporters were. Barry Werber, the gentleman in the film who talks about a Passover Seder, he, you know, a reporter showed up at a store the next day with a box of donuts after the attack. I mean, this is not how journalism should be happening. We need to, if we we're taking, we also need to be giving. And um, it's, it's a code of ethics, how we treat people. Uh, it's wildly inappropriate to do things like that. And they should always be at the forefront um, of whatever uh, their feelings and needs are. And so I interviewed them in their homes where they felt most comfortable. And also uh, they saw iterations of the film because I strongly felt that those that lived it should tell it. And it would be done when they felt most comfortable and they would have full agency over that. And we had probably five different versions of this film. Um, and I want to thank them all for watching them because that wasn't easy, but their feedback was really important for me because I really wanted, they were my most important audience. And if they weren't comfortable, then I don't know how I was gonna be able to succeed in reaching people. So I really think that's you know the core way in which you do it. You can't rush, you have to take your time. And I stayed in Pittsburgh full time and when they felt comfortable, I was there to respond. So that's essentially how it works. Beautiful. And now my final question before we turn it over to our audience is, what do you want our audience to do? What should they be doing now? And this goes really to, to any of you. Um, uh, they've seen this film, they've been inspired, apart from telling their friends to watch it on HBO, um, available on HBO Max too, uh, maybe. Um, what, sh what should our audience be doing? What's our call to action? Vote. For whom? Just kidding, we, we're not going there. Come see me, I'll write a list out for you. <laughs> I, I would just say that one of the things we have to do is hold leadership accountable and just, you know, really intervene and dispel people's preconceived notions of others. I can tell you, every day of my life I hear someone say something and I am forever stunned by the lack of ignorance, by the lack of education people have. It's just like slang. It's like slang. They say things about people, anybody, everybody, uh, women, black people, Jews, all of us, anything. And, and it's just in New York City, in the middle of New York City, I'm hearing this. And we have to find a way to sit down and talk this through and really shut this down because it's, it's really dangerous, as you can see. And uh, it's time for us to move on. You know, we're approaching 2023. I think we really have to find a way to build bridges and start diminishing this and really holding people accountable who participate in this type of behavior. Can I add to that? Yes, please. I, I, I think what's really important for me to impart upon everybody. I have spent almost 30 years in law enforcement. 
and a lot of time as a crisis manager. And whenever you show up on the scene of a horrific event, you would interview folks and they'd say, I never thought it happened here. And I think we as a Jewish community have to get past that mindset that it'll never happen here and that we should prepare if it is happened. I, I, don't, I am not living my life in fear. My job and our job is to empower our community. And an empowered community is a resilient community. So I think it's really important that we take that mantra and, and really train our entire community. I, when I retired from the FBI and I went to Pittsburgh, the first uh, uh, mantle of our program was to train all 55,000 Jews in Pittsburgh. Now we need to train all 8 million Jews in the United States. Yes. And that is really what we look to do in each and every one of our synagogues, every one of our community centers. In my group, we also work with other affected and targeted groups. I've been in mosques. I've been in all different type faith-based churches, uh, houses of worship, and, and I think we need to take ownership. Steve said it, take ownership of our own security. And our Pittsburgh police did a phenomenal job in their response. And when they responded, not one other civilian was shot, and they went right to that attacker, and they suffered some uh, pretty horrific wounds of their own. But we need to, as a community, take action, and we call commitment to action. So. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. I would, of course, piggyback on that, that we need to have the run, hide, and fight training. If you have not been trained, you need to be trained. Also, the stop the bleed training. If you have not had it, you need to get it. I'm really proud to bring our audience and make them a part of this. Are there one more? Sorry. One more. Just, just an example. Here, the, the two of us stand. I see so many similarities between the two of us. If everybody would look at people that way and not, I mean, there are many ways to figure that you and I are opposites, but there are so many similarities. That's what you have to see. Thank you. That's, that, that's, that's probably that's the most good. powerful part of it. Um, oh, uh, Isaac, can I yes. just say, add of one course. last thing? Um, as a as a New Yorker, um, I was a you know newcomer to the amazing city of Pittsburgh, and um, I'm now a Steelers fan. But um, you know the Jets are getting a little better, so I think about that. Uh, but what what I was so taken by was the way that the communities came together to encircle the Jewish community with, with love. And that was just an incredible thing to, to see. You know, the way that the, the community uh, communities bonded together and were there for each other. And, you know, as New York is a, is a you know, huge metropolis, and it's, it's a little bit more challenging, but we have to figure out a way to break down the silos. You know, we're so divided and we're so polarized. And if, we, if this film can inspire each of us to, to work personally to try to figure out ways to break down those divisions, I feel like we will have accomplished what we set out to do. We already knew each other. We, the communities already knew each other before this. Not only had we come together in times of trouble, we were accustomed to coming together for other things as well. We worked on initiatives together. We gave Devar Torahs in each other's congregations. We, we knew each other. We keep saying that's the last one, but we'll, we'll do one more. <laughs> If I could just make it, maybe break it down into something a bit more bite-sized. Uh, th this, this seems like such a, a long-range plan. This is, seems such something that's so big and so, so maybe potentially hard to tackle. I think there's uh, an interesting lesson we can, we can learn from, we just read in the, at Simcha's Torah about the, the end of the life of Moses, so everyone knows the story, but uh, what, do we, what do we draw from it? Everybody knows that Moses actually never made it into the land of Israel. So we all have our, our things in life that we may not accomplish. 
but there was a, there was a rabbi thousands of years ago who said it's not that what you accomplish, it's what you start. I think Anthony should have given a spoiler alert about whether Moses makes it into the <laughs> It's over. Start again. So we have some questions from the audience. Let's uh, take one up here. Here, I have a microphone. So in the spirit of um, like connecting with people that are so different than you, I had a lot of trouble with that guy in the synagogue with all the guns. It was really hard to watch. And I was wondering, like, I don't know. I mean, did you, were you trying to make a, a real connection with him? Or was your heart in your mouth? Or, I mean, it's almost a parody of the worst, I don't know, you know. I don't believe him for a second, you know? And I mean, and that, the fact that he could say that about AK-47s, you know, that's not what, I mean, come on, really? So it was almost like, I, I was like, you probably, it's hard to be on the other side of this camera and be quiet and just let him say his thing. So I just wanted to ask you about that. And after this horrible thing happened, you know, my shul, Romamu, had, you know, a healing service and all sorts of stuff. And it was, I remember watching it, uh, I remember watching it on my, on my, on my laptop because I couldn't leave my kid. And she was like, well, what happened? And I, I sort I explained and she said, in the synagogue? They shot them in the synagogue? And I, I, it was really hard for me to explain this to her, you know? She's like, why is Rabbi David crying? Why is everyone crying in our synagogue? Some other people in the synagogue got hurt. How did they get hurt? Anyway, what happened after that was a big issue. Do we have a locked box with guns and some people get training or not? And it really was a big issue for people. I mean, m most of us did not want to have a locked box with guns and know that some people had training and knew how to get in the box and other people didn't. So mm. I think the training thing's really complicated for people who don't Brad, you like to... guns. I, I, I understand what you're saying about the individual in the synagogue with the AK-47s. That is tough to watch, but I think it is important to see what people are out there thinking what is our threat? What's the assessment out there on what we're really combating? But the question of whether or not our community members, our ushers and our greeters should have weapons in a synagogue, I, I am not traditionally for that. We've actually put out a very large uh, paper that we provide firearms and the faithful, and it's a discussion for synagogues to have. So I, I, I come down to leave the guns in the hands of professionals. That's law enforcement. And that's who should have them. Now, I know that's hard for a lot of people to hear that. And coming as a Marine and an FBI agent and a guy that carries a gun for my business and for what I do for a living or did for a living, I'm probably, I don't want to say in the minority, but I truly believe no one should have an AK-47, an AR-15. There's no room for assault weapons in our country. And I don't think that we as a community, that's the last thing we should be doing for security in our synagogues is placing guns in the hands of our congregants. We need to do everything else. We need to do the training. We need to discuss access control. We really need to have a thoughtful layered approach to keep our community safe. And that's really what our security directors do across the country. When I retired, I was the 19th Jewish communal security director across the country. We have about 80 right now. So we're a growing field and we're hiring folks all the time to do that to protect our community. It is a complicated subject and I'm happy to provide you those documents and I'll give you a card and I'm happy to give it to you for you and your leadership and your stool to make those decisions. I and, hope that answers the question. And, and I'll just uh, add, just, Judith is a notable her filmmaker, actually. She has a beautiful film called Love and Stuff. And um, I want to just answer your question about the, the gun shop, Judith, because um, I was filming Barry Werber at the JCC Inquirer, and I saw a woman in the back of the room crying. And I asked her if she was uncomfortable with the filming because I wanted to make sure she was OK. And she said she had heard that there was a synagogue gun shop created, a gun shop created in a synagogue after the attack. And I, I, was, I was just, 
again, in a state of shock. And so I started immediately doing research. And I said, I'm going to go down there immediately after we leave the JCC. We're in Squirrel Hill. And I had the cameraman with me and the sound person. And I found out, I found where it was. But I realized on driving there, I it used to be, it was um, a couple that bought an old synagogue and they restored it. They put a few hundred thousand dollars into it and they started out making it an internet cafe and a very old sort of steel mill, long gone town where much, there wasn't even a university or anything there. And they tried to make it other things and the only thing that worked was, was selling guns. Uh, so I put on a wire, I put on a leveler mic, and I told the cameraman and the sound man, if something happens, call 911, because I had no idea what I was walking into, if this guy was going to be a lunatic and shoot me, or what was going to happen. So I, I just went in, and I, I was completely, you know, offended by everything I saw, but I wanted to find out what made him do this. And I we had the conversation you saw in the film, and I even went as far as... Um, raising money to take the religious symbols down uh, to do a follow-up scene. But um, his wife got involved, and she thought we were trying to do something around Trump, and she wouldn't let us come back. I was going to actually bring Ellen Sirloff down, and we were going to have a conversation about how offensive it was and try to make a bridge, because we have a lot of bridges in Pittsburgh, and it's something we take pride in doing. Uh, we have like 600 bridges, I think. But, oh, but, but, but so, so that didn't get to happen, unfortunately. But that, that'll tell you a little bit about it. We, we have another question up here. Um, the film was absolutely phenomenal, and I'm, I'm pretty much speechless. Um, thank you all for coming and talking to us about it. Um, it's really an honor to have you with us in New York. Um, but my question is, you have a candidate running for governor in Pennsylvania. Have you been able to get him as a copy of the film to screen? Not yet, but we, we can. But you're planning. But I don't think that candidate is going to win. I, I really God, don't think I so. I hope not. But, uh, <laughs> we, th but it's it, frightening yeah, I mean, what he is espousing. It is frightening. It is very frightening. You're absolutely correct, and we're monitoring it carefully, and we're doing, like, like I think Ellen said, get out and vote, and, and everybody here is very aware of that uh, candidate, but I don't think uh, we're going to do everything we can to stop that from happening. Question, question up on top. Thank you so much for for the film. Um, I'm Reverend Saboni from the Church of John Paul and Clement, and what we did um, last year was to take our youth to the Tree of Life. We, t we drove there, and then from there went to Charleston to Mother Emmanuel. So I hope you make a movie about that. But um, there, there is... Y y there is, I haven't seen it. But um, the, the shooter referenced the immigrants yes. and also referenced Christ Church. And I believe he referenced in the region. And people don't believe when I say to the congregation I was going to take the youth, they said, why? I said, because they need to see Brianna Taylor Morio. They need to see the Tree of Life. They need to know that these things happen because they don't, just people don't believe it. They said, no, it could never happen here. It could never happen here. So thank you so, so much, and look forward to everyone believing that we can turn this tide of hate into what you, the action, the shofar, and the trumpet. Thank, thank you. you so much. We have a question over here. We're going to take one last question down here. Uh, can yeah. I? Wait, oh, sorry, I, sorry, there was, there was uh, responses. Sorry, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> to, to be part, to take part, of such an extraordinary uh, document is what I live for and what I've suffered to be part of. Um, it's beautiful to create buildings, churches, where we can go and worship. As a child, the church was the only place our people had that we felt safe. But it's very important as well to realize that the true synagogue, the true mosque, the true church is in us. We are the living mosque. We are the living church. Our gathering creates a church. This is a mosque. This is a, this is a temple. And it's very important 
to, re to, remember, uh, to remember that because this church will never die. Because all, all of the people who will see the work will become part of the church. Yeah, sorry. Just a quick statement on, I know you mentioned that uh, um, immigration, immigrants is part of the reason and the rationale is mentioned in the film. Um, you know, one of the ways that the, the Muslim and Jewish community have worked together for many years amongst many, you know, have had deep relationships is really regarding immigrants and refugees as well. Um, before um, the shooting, the, the, the largest resettlement organization in Pittsburgh was JFCS, Jewish Family and, and Community Services. Uh, anybody want to guess what the biggest resettlement agency after that was? JFCS. Yes. <laughs> no, no effect. No intended effect happened. It only deepened our relationships. We did more programming. We did a lot of events after that. The, you know, the, the Jewish community, you know, welcoming so many uh, of the Muslim community um, that we've had so many people come, you know, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from different places, you know, like to come and see the Jewish community be the first community to join them in open arms. And then having us working together with the Jewish, Muslim, Christian face and, and folks who don't identify all coming together. I think it's always a beautiful story and picture. And I know it's not the focus, but it's always something that I think about is that that never changed. And I appreciate it. I'll take one more question down here. Um, I don't know how much material you had on the shooter himself. But what I missed was more on the shooter. I could understand anti-Semitism because you see it all the time. This was far more than that. The guy bought his weapon way before. He planned this out. He plotted it. W what motivated him? What motivated him? And plain old anti-Semitism, some tweets that he did, well, we didn't get anything. We got the guy shooting up, and that's all we got. And it left me hungry to know how somebody could do something so rapacious, so awful. Thank you for that question. Uh, it's, it certainly isn't in line with the trauma-informed work that I like to do, but I did not want to give that person a platform. There is a kind of perversion in our society now with true crime stories. It's endless and perpetual, and it is everywhere. And when I was early in the making of this film, I contacted one of the notable studios who told me to make the film about the shooter. And I said, under no certain terms would I go anywhere near that. And I really did not want to give much attention to him at all. We laid out some basic facts of the matter. He, there was a lot of inflammatory rhetoric at the time. It was during the midterm elections. There was an incredible threat of, from the migrant caravan coming in. George Soros was being blamed for funding it. Um, there was um, a, a talking about Hayes, as, as we show the um, graphic in the film, uh, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society supporting these refugees and the Jews were behind it. And he felt that Jews were going to, evil invaders, they were bringing in the evil invaders to take away white people jobs. And he was one of those people. And that's why you see the other rabbi, Rabbi Perlman, talking about the fear that whiteness is dying in this country. So that, those were really the basics of what we felt was necessary to tell you about the person who did this evil act. I didn't want to give him more airtime out of respect. And um, I, I, I don't want to know more about him, frankly. And I wasn't going to speak, but I just I think I speak on behalf of all of the, the family members that we thank Trish for taking such a trauma informed approach to this, that we were able to tell our stories of our loved ones and not talk about the shooter. That's very important to us. I just I just wanted to say that um, this film is not about him. It's about us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all right. I think it would be wonderful as part of his incarceration that he, it would be mandatory that he would hear each day uh, Sister Audrey play 
the show fall <laughs> and that he would be required to watch the film. That's right. Yes, excellent. Yes. Should be woken up by the shofar every morning. I think that's, that's the way to go. Um, folks, I, I really want to thank you so much for being here with us and sharing this with us. <laughs> thank you all for being a part. Please do tell your friends. And, um, and we look forward to seeing you at other HBO events. HBO, October 26, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all. Tell Have all a good your night, friends. and we'll see you soon. Get home safe. <laughs>